welcome to this, the first of the O'Reilly Radar Global Issues webcast. And thanks, too, to Dr. Saul Griffiths for kicking it off with this amazing presentation you're about to see on energy literacy. I'll save you from reading Saul's distinguished pedigree and long list of accomplishments, and you've likely read it yourself on the sign-up page for this presentation. But I will say his multiple degrees from MIT, his many inventions and startup companies whose goals are to create next generation solutions for our energy needs, ideally position him to help us understand this topic. And at least from the vantage of Northern California, as a pleasant brownout free summer concludes and gas prices have barely nudged above $3 a gallon, it's easy to imagine that energy issues have receded over the horizon to be dealt with at some distant time. But of course that's not true, and energy is a major issue, perhaps the defining issue for us as we move into the second decade of the 21st century. But how can we understand capital E energy if we don't share a common understanding and literacy, one that gives us a tangible sense of our energy consumption and of what it takes to meet that? That's the goal of this presentation. So sit back and hold on and welcome Saul. Thank you. All right, Saul. Saul, you have control now. Just click on your tab to bring it to the front. All right, so everyone will have to bear with me a little as I learn how to use this WebEx. And uh, one warning, so this is a fairly serious topic and can get slightly depressing. Um, it's much easier to make it a very personal, slightly more positive discussion when I can walk around in front of people and smile. Um, so you're just going to have to visualize that although a lot of this stuff sounds hard and and a little uh, troubling, that you can smile and be positive about this. Um, we, we sort of can solve these problems. So, uh, very brief overview. I uh, have started energy companies, uh, renewable energy, uh, one in particular is, is recently high profile McCartney Power working on high altitude wind power. Um, and uh, I was asked, so to give you the origins of the presentation you'll see today, I was often asked to talk about uh, in detail uh, in detail that company, um, but I always felt like I needed to give some context first. So originally I developed a conversation about, sort of represented by the image on the left hand side here of the planet, you know, what is the amount of energy that the world uses, how do we use it, um, and that was a sort of story of very big numbers and it was very impersonal, and then I realized that I probably should put myself into the picture, uh, represented by the sort of silhouette on the right hand side, uh, and that led uh, a process for me of understanding and calculating the energy use of every aspect of my life, and we'll see that uh, in great detail. Um, and I think that those two stories, when seen together, enable us all to put our own individual uh, behaviors and our own life styles in the context of the larger energy issue. So very briefly, some basics. Um, I apologize to those in the audience who know this stuff intuitively, but I think it's good to just remind ourselves what is energy. Uh, energy is measured in joules. It's a sort of fundamental physical unit. Um, the amount of energy, it's a quantity, and the quantity of energy to lift an apple from the ground up onto the, of the table is one joule. Power, uh, and I'll be talking a lot about power today, is measured in watts. Power is the rate at which you use energy. So if you lift that same apple from the ground to the table in one second, it takes about one watt of power. So uh, it takes, you know, if you were lifting 40 apples per second from the ground to the table, that takes 40 watts of power. And incidentally, the laptop that I'm driving this presentation from uh, requires 40 watts of power to run. So imagine, and you're probably, a lot of you are listening in on an Apple laptop or something similar, you would have to be lift, lifting a crate of apples from the ground to the table every second uh, to power your computer for this uh, for this presentation. To further give you some intuition for the sort of the orders of magnitude or the scale of uh, power, um, it takes about 100 watts of uh, biochemical energy to drive you as a human. So that's what your that's the the rate at which you're using energy just to be sitting there or standing there reading or listening. Uh, 
A kilowatt or a thousand watts is how much uh, power it takes to boil water, uh, irrespective of whether it's an electric or a gas kettle. Um, a megawatt is about the scale of a large wind turbine or of a diesel locomotive or a, a large commuter train. Um, a gigawatt is a very large amount of power. That's about the scale of a nuclear reactor or of a large hydroelectric uh, generator like the Hoover Dam. A terawatt, and you'll be hearing me talk a lot about terawatts, is a lot harder to get an intuitive understanding for. Um, and the closest I've come is a, that's how much power the world consumed in 1890. We now consume 16 to 18 terawatts, depending upon how you count, uh, just to put that in perspective. All right, so I'm going to begin with the personal side. How would you figure out how much power do I use, Paul Griffith? And, and from this, you can get a perspective of, of how you calculate how much energy or power you use uh, and um, the, the, why it's a difficult process. So I'm going to use, I use power because the rate at which you use energy enables you to um, have a look at things that you do on very different time scales, but you can look at them all at the same time. So doing something I do, if you do something yearly, like flying a certain number of miles, uh, you can figure out by you know, how much energy it takes to fly each mile uh, and how many seconds there are in a year, how much power equivalent it was for you to fly 105,000 miles over the year. So it's, power is a nice way of averaging all of these different time scales. You do things look monthly, like get your electricity bill, it's measured in kilowatt hours, and you can convert those kilowatt hours per month into a, a, a rate at which you're using energy on average for your electricity bill. Similarly, if you do something daily, like just drinking a, uh, a, an energy drink, you can figure out how much energy it took to produce that energy drink. You can you know that you're doing it once a day, you know how many seconds there are in a day, so you can get this sort of average uh, rate at which you're using energy or the power for doing that daily thing. Then you can simply add all of those things that you do on those different time scales together and you get the overall power uh, required to drive your lifestyle, or the rate at which you're using energy. Um, another way to think of that, or to, to draw an analogy in your head, is you can think about um, your life as the number of light bulbs required to power it. So if you had, for example, a 12,000 watt lifestyle after doing all of that addition, that's the equivalent to having 120, 100 watt light bulbs burning all the time uh, to support your lifestyle. The, uh, or, or if you want to use compact fluorescence, it's about 1,000 compact fluorescence burning all the time to support a 12,000 watt lifestyle. So let's calculate in detail my personal power consumption or energy use. So this was my, uh, this is every flight that I took in 2007. It was 112,000 miles. If I assume each one of those flights was on a, on a fully loaded 767 or 747, I know that how many megajoules of energy per passenger kilometer it is that's published in those airlines' uh, annual reports. And I can estimate from all of that that it was about 8,000 watts equivalent for all of my flying for 2007, or equivalent to about 18,500 kilograms of CO2 produced. Mind you, this only includes the, the gasoline or kerosene burnt in the aircraft. It does not include the energy of running the airports and um, all of the sort of bad meals you eat in airport lounges. This is purely the energy for the flying. Driving. So in 2007, I drove about 10,000 miles. I drove it in a variety of vehicles. Uh, the majority was actually in a, a Honda Insight, which is a very innovative um, hybrid vehicle uh, that gets about 55 miles per gallon. Uh, that was the equivalent of driving from San Francisco to New York via Chicago, Seattle, Chicago, and Atlanta. I drove about 2,000 miles in rental vehicles. Um, uh, things like taxis and, and rental vehicles. Uh, so that's the equivalent of New York up to Boston uh, and uh, back down to Key West. Uh, I drove about 600 miles in a, in a, in a Sprinter cargo van um, that gets about 20 miles per gallon. Uh, I joked that to safely transit across the south of the U.S., I had to drive in a pickup truck, a Toyota Hilux from Jacksonville to Tucson. 
uh, and then I drove a, a 1959 vintage uh, Volkswagen dune buggy about a thousand miles at about 25 miles a gallon. So I can add up all of that and uh, and figure it out that I use about 1500 watts of power for the, the average of my driving. In reality, all of these trips wasn't a, a, a transcontinental trip. It was just driving to the grocery store or to work or etc. To put that 10,000 miles in perspective, um, the average US citizen drives about 15,000 miles a year. So I both, both drove less than the average American and I drove on average in more fuel efficient cars. Uh, and so for many people, their driving power would be something like 3,000 watts. Um, this is, is the energy consumption of my house. I'm assuming that I'm sharing equally with my wife the, the energy of all of the various components. Um, the cooking and the, and the hot water heating is driven by gas in my house, and you can see those along the bottom. Uh, the heat for the house is also done by gas, and it turns out that that's the majority of uh, energy I use in my house is actually for the gas heating. You can see that it, it, we heat more in January and December than we do in, in the summer months of June or July. And the rest and, and a much less significant portion of my energy use is all of the electrical devices. And I've measured every single one of these from the fridge to my electric toothbrush to my phone chargers to my two laptops to my stereo. And you can see all of those little pieces there. If I average all of that out, I'm, I'm using, on average, 625 watts to drive the, the electric and gas consumption of my uh, house. I can do something similar for my office. Uh, it required a lot of heating in the winter months, very little during the summer months, but a pretty constant sort of 400 watts um, for all of the computers and lights that people were running in that workplace. You can also calculate the energy use for food. Uh, in all honesty, the world is still figuring out how to do this accurately. So you have to understand this is sort of an estimate with, with reasonably large um, uh, errors. Uh, the, the majority of energy use in, in my eating or my diet is in the proteins, the meat and the fish. And that's because of how much energy it takes to create all the grain that creates all the meat. Uh, the values for the farming, transportation, and fertilizer. This is actually taking the U.S. Department of Agriculture statistics for the entire United States um, energy use in food production and averaging it across the 300 million people in the population. Uh, so this is a gross sort of average. Um, I can even measure things like the two glasses of wine I drink per night. Uh, and there was an interesting study on the carbon footprint of wine by a guy called Dr. Vino, and he could estimate that it takes about 76 watts for those two glasses of wine. Uh, incidentally, he also figured out that if you live west of the Mississippi, it's more energy efficient to drink Napa Valley or Californian wines. And if you live east of the Mississippi in, for example, New York, it's more energy efficient to drink wine from France or Bordeaux. Uh, principally because the shipping uh, shipping on large container ships is much more energy efficient than trucking across the United States. Uh, we all live in a society, and society, you, you know, you pay tax dollars when you, those dollars are spent by the government on things that use energy. Um, and so here's some estimates of some components of the energy use that society spends on your behalf. Uh, these estimates are just the published data for um, these government departments' use of uh, basically their PG&E bills and their gasoline bills. Um, and if you divide it by, again, roughly the population of uh, North America, 300 million people, this is my one 300 million share of the U.S. infrastructure, about 100 watts for the U.S. military, 50 watts for the nuclear uh, protection facilities, about 20 watts for government, uh, small one, one watt is my share of all of the... Uh, rocket fuel for the space program at NASA, and about five watts for the US Postal Service. Then, of course, we also own a lot of physical objects. There's something called embodied energy. That's the energy that it, was, that it took to extract all of the minerals and things that, and that do the manufacturing for all of the objects in your life. And so you can see this is, uh, there's quite a lot of detail here. Um, I have, Newspapers are a significant component because uh, I was getting 
I subscribe it to the New York Times three days a week. Um, my house is a significant contributor because it's a very large, heavy object. Um, catamarans, I, I have a, I'm a hobbyist sailor, and, and they, again, they are very large, heavy objects. It took a lot of energy to produce those machines. But you can see in the bottom segment there, I'm counting everything down to my clothes and my underwear and my furniture and even to shampoo and, and those things that I've used in my life. If I add all that up, it's about 2,500 watts for my physical stuff. So this is the uh, assembled picture of my entire life. Um, and to give you the, the quick view, so from roughly 12 o'clock going anti-clockwise to about 7 o'clock, that is every individual flight I took in 2007 and it's power equivalent. From 7 o'clock to about 6 o'clock, that is all of my driving. So you can see overwhelmingly by category, flying was the... Uh, largest consumer of energy or power in my life. Uh, the yellow section is the, the gas and electricity for my house. The orange section is my food. Uh, the red section is my work. The pink section is all of the embodied energy and all of the objects that I own. The green section is uh, up at about 2 o'clock is the energy used for the government. Interestingly, the, the sort of olive-colored piece, uh, maybe I can even draw on this uh, here. Um, that is just my estimate for the embodied energy in the 4 million miles of the US road system um, and my portion of that. And so before every American wakes up every morning, about 3% of their sort of energy or power or carbon budget is consumed just in having and servicing this road infrastructure. Um, then this large area here, the unaccounted uh, section, this is what I, I know that I pay tax dollars and that they somehow result in energy use, um, but it's very hard to calculate that. And so this is the, so the generic problem of carbon calculators or energy accounting is there are still things that we don't know how to count and you have to do a lot of looking at the supply chain to figure it out in detail. So you can see I use about 18,000 watts. Uh, that's my estimate. Um, if I use the same, just incidentally, if I use the same uh, the same data and put it into a whole range of, uh, you can see these carbon calculators, that they're all, the estimates are wildly varying and typically low. About the only correlation you can say is that if it's a government website like the EPA, they bid low. And if they're trying to sell you carbon credits like this one, they bid high. So. My calculation is about 18,000 watts, but knowing the errors, I, I'm trying to be conservative and bid low, but knowing the errors, I would be not at all surprised if it was in fact 25,000 watts. That is just me. Uh, this is, the, you know, this is a million people, so this is sort of an awkward uh, segue into the demographics of power consumption. So I was about 18,000 watts or 18 kilowatts. The average American, you can see here, is 11.1 kilowatts. This is by state in the United States, the, the power consumption of all of the, the people in those states. So Alaskans use the most energy at about 37 watts. Uh, New York and Rhode Island use the least at about 6 or 7 kilowatts. Uh, and where I am in California, the average is about 8 here. Yeah. Um, so we can do a similar uh, Look at the demographics globally. Here is the US average, this dotted red line. America is, in fact, the 10th most energy intensive per capita country in the world. Uh, Qatar is first, um, followed by Iceland. Uh, even Canada uses slightly more energy than America. Um, and then you can see it trailing off down here. I'm just showing the top 50 countries. If you, in fact, take the global average, the global average is this green line. It's about 22 or 2400 watts. Um, the interesting thing, and this is playing into the climate uh, debate that you're hearing, is that China is, in fact, not even on this chart. It's somewhere over to the right uh, at about 2,000 watts per person. And India, which is way off to the right, is only about 1,000 watts per person. Um, this is sort of those numbers average. We can skip over that. Okay, so historically that might have you say, well, um, when were, how, how did I come to use so much power? And I was trying to figure out whether my father or my grandfather or my great-grandfather who used less power. So I found the historical uh, power consumption per person 
uh, or power consumption to the United States, and you can see that it increased uh, greatly. So this blue line here is the power consumption per capita or per person in the United States historically. Essentially, since 1800, we've been using 3,500 watts. In about 1880, we started to learn how to burn coal and oil instead of just trees, and then everything started to increase rapidly. Things went down through the uh, Depression and World War One, uh, World War Two, and then we started increasing again up to about the 11,000 watts we use today. Um, I might skip this slide. This is the total power consumption per country from 1965 to 2005. We were using five terawatts of power globally in 1965. We're using about 15 terawatts or 16 terawatts today. Um, I'm going to skip over a lot of these. All of these slides are available at energyliteracy.com, so you can go back and have a look. There's more data than we perhaps need to go into. Um, so I'm just going to move forward a little bit. Uh, all right. So here is the total energy flow for the United States in 2008. Again, to get a sense of the demographics of how we use energy. And so. On the input side here, this is primary energy. We use 798 gigawatts of coal, 700 gigawatts of natural gas, 252 of crude oil, 283 from nuclear or electric, 245 from renewable, and the largest of all is this uh, petroleum, 921 watts. In total, this line here, that's 3.56 terawatts, or 3,562 gigawatts of power is the supply. So America exports a little bit of that, but I guess what we're really concerned is this consumption line here. We consume about 3.3 uh, 3 .3 terawatts, about a terawatt in transportation, uh, about a terawatt industrially in making the things that we use and building our infrastructure, uh, 620 gigawatts commercially, about 723 gigawatts in our homes. Um, we can actually just look at the electricity generation portion of that, and this is this helps illustrate another point. We count primary energy uh, on this side, so that's how much energy was in the coal, was in the gas, was available in it. Um, but this conversion losses, so when we burn coal or when we burn fossil fuels, you don't get all of the energy out. They, they typically run through a heat engine, and they, those things suffer losses. And, those, and this is often, this is one side of the efficiency question. We lose more than half of the primary energy that goes into the system in running our, for example, coal-fired power plants only run at 35 or 40 percent conversion efficiency. So a huge amount of energy is lost. Uh, and in fact, this is the energy that we, uh, we actually use. People often say there's a huge amount of loss in transmission and distribution. That's not true. It's just these are the losses here in, in transmission and distribution. The majority losses are actually in the conversion losses through the, the, the heat engines uh, that we do for conversion. Um, and just to emphasize that point, so here is the energy input in the bar on the left. Uh, we put in about uh, 1.4 terawatts in, as, of primary energy into the electricity grid in the United States. Um, this is how we use it by sector. Um, and when, so for example, residential retail, so this is actually the electricity that you buy, this bright yellow section. The orange uh, segment is an estimate of how much energy is lost or not used due to inefficient conversion. So in fact, we're losing more energy in that this one, this bar here, we're losing more energy than is actual, uh, actually available at the end user. This, for example, is why we would like, we should be doing more cogeneration. Most of this energy is heat in this bar, um, and so cogeneration means extract not only the electrical energy here, but also use this heat more efficiently in other places. All right, so what is the result of now giving you a perspective of um, how much energy an individual uses and how that compares to globally and also how we generate electricity? What is the, you know, there's some reason why we're so worried about energy and this is really a historic atmospheric CO2 concentration, the, increase, the rise of CO2 in the atmosphere. So here is the 400,000 year view. We were always below about 300 parts per million of CO2. 
And you can see that in the last century or two, we've very rapidly increased this. To look at it in the last thousand year view, um, this is what it looks like. We were up you know, below 300 until sort of the Industrial Revolution when we started burning coal. And we're rapidly increasing, and we're now, in fact, at about 390 as of this year. See, past a million in the atmosphere. This is the historic uh, Keeling curve popularized by Al Gore, and this shows just how rapidly we are ratcheting up the uh, CO2 uh, levels in the atmosphere. Um, this slide is just interesting. There, You can actually do an estimate of the total amount of CO2 that has been emitted um, from burning fossil fuels from 1751 to 2004, the so pre-industrial revolution to uh, recent times. And this is billions of metric tons of carbon. Um, the United States in this picture is, in fact, number one. So they have contributed the largest amount of CO2. Uh, the top six countries here combined, Russia, China, Germany, Japan, the United Kingdom, and the, and the United States, they have been the majority. Uh, they, they are responsible for more than 75% of the CO2 in the atmosphere. Um, and obviously, the smaller countries down here, this is, again, just the top 50 don't use very much. So in terms of who is responsible for the, uh, the carbon in the atmosphere, we actually have the data and we can point the finger if you like. All right, so we've, we've put too much. Here's, here's a, this is a very basic sort of carbon flow diagram. Um, these numbers here for like soil, so there's three fields. So the estimate is there's 3,000 billion tons of carbon in the world soil. So it's carbon, not CO2. If you want CO2, multiply all these numbers by uh, roughly 4.4. In the oceans, there's 40,000 gigatons of carbon. In all the world vegetation and rainforest, there's about 700 gigatons. In uh, the remaining accessible fossil fuels, there's about 1,600 gigatons. And in the atmosphere today, there's about 700. So what we're doing right now is taking this, um, is taking the accessible fossil fuels here. We're burning them and sending them up into the atmosphere. About 50% of them remain there. A whole lot is absorbed by the ocean. So at the rate of 8 billion tons a year, we're putting it from here up here. So this sort of ends the question of will we run out of fossil fuels first or have climate problems? Because if you burn all of this and put it in the atmosphere, you're going to double atmospheric CO2 concentration. So we, in fact, do not, hope, hopefully we do not burn all of the remaining fossil fuels. Uh, this is the actual measured temperature change uh, globally. This is this data is from the Stern report, uh, the British climate report. Um, for every red, large red dot, that means a one degree Celsius temperature increase per decade for the last 25 years. So that's four, uh, you know, five or six degrees Fahrenheit increase in the last 25 years where you see the large red dot. You can see the overwhelming trend here is warming. And, the, and this is where the data comes to the average global surface warming. And that's what we talk about when we talk about uh, warming the Earth by one or two or three or four degrees. It's global average uh, surface warming. So I try to think about this problem in terms of you know, um, humanity needs to figure out what temperature they want. And from that, we can then figure out the engineering task of what we need to do in terms of energy supply and energy use. So the first thing you need to do is figure out you know, what are we going to commit to? What is this temperature here that we're going to, you know, we are, we are engineering the climate. What is the choice that we're going to set for our engineering goal? How would you determine that? Well, we have three tools. We have climate models, and you hear a lot about climate models. These are physics and chemistry-based computer models of the planet and its system. And there's more than a dozen competing models, and they compete in open peer review trying to get, trying, they're all trying to be more and more and more accurate. That's why the climate models are improving. You've heard a lot about scenarios. These are sort of guesses of what humanity is going to do. This is where you hear the business as usual model versus the various other models. These are, you know, how fast is population going to grow, how much is energy intensity and energy use going to grow. Um, and then you hear the things that make headlines are the impact studies. These are the things that say at two degrees we'll lose 90% of all of the coral reefs in the world. At three degrees we're going to flood London and Florida, etc., etc., etc. These are the, the they get the headlines and they're called impact studies. So they're sort of the tools you might figure out in use to figure out what temperature you want to hit. 
So here's a graph that sort of shows uh, um, all of that information in one thing. So these, this orange bar represents the, uh, the end temperature results from the climate models we have that we might get if we did 450 parts per million. So the, the bar is, the length height of the bar is the accuracy to which we know it. So um, if we hit 450, we might stabilize at 1.5 degrees, or we might, in fact, go up to 3.5 degrees. Um, and it gives you, you know, roughly a 30 to 50% chance of staying below 2 degrees Celsius if you hit 450. Um, and you can do that same thing for 500 all the way up to 1,000. The error bars increase, or the uncertainty increases, as we increase the concentration. Um, so these are the scenarios. Um, the, so the, 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 the red scenario, I think, is, is uh, business as usual. Um, so that's we just keep doing what we're doing. Pink is the, the a worst case scenario. Um, the blue scenario, that's the best scenario that, that the scenario modelers have been able to come out, out with. Uh, that is the globally aware um, energy reduction sort of scenario. Even that scenario has us hitting two degrees by the end of the century. Uh, the disturbing thing about this is that um, even our worst case scenario, so since 2000 when these scenarios were really popularized, we're on roughly this trajectory now, so we're doing even worse than the worst case scenario on carbon emissions. Um, and then impact studies, to sort of summarize those impact studies, you know, at one and a half degrees, we're going to lose 10% of all species. The estimate is around 90% of coral reefs are lost at two degrees. There's going to be resource wars at two and a half degrees, and then more than a billion people facing water shortages at three degrees or more. We lose 50 of species, 20 to 50% of species up here at three and a half degrees, and you lose whole cities and countries uh, due to sea level rise at four and a half degrees. So this is sort of the litany of horrors. Um, the, the biggest litany of horror are the irreversible feedbacks. These are things like the, the ice sheets melting and the, the methane in the tundra and the methane clathrates in the waters melting and the methane going in the atmosphere. And most, people, most scientists believe that those irreversible feedbacks will happen at about two degrees. So this is why a lot of people say you might want to stay below two degrees. Um, so the business as usual model has us hitting more than 800 parts per million. Uh, the Stern report was saying, oh, we might try to hit 450. I'm going to argue that we might want to hit uh, 450 here. I would prefer probably to do better. I think Jim Hansen's estimate that we should stay at 350 is good. But that's going to be ambitious considering we've already passed that at, and we are at 385 or 390 today. Um, okay. So. Imagine you committed to a scenario of 450 parts per million as your target um, because you wanted to stay at or below an average 2 degrees of warming, even though that, that average 2 degrees of warming is not perfect. What do you have to do? You, you have to sort of go back to this carbon cycle and you need to rebalance it. Um, so the naive look at this is that we should only be putting about the same amount of carbon into the atmosphere every year um, that, we, that is absorbed by the oceans. The problem with that naive view is that as you, as the, the oceans are lose, firstly the oceans are losing their ability to absorb that carbon, um, and secondly that uh, the ocean acidity increases as the carbon concentration increases, and that causes all sorts of problems with ocean ecosystems and fishery supply. Nevertheless, we're going to choose that as a, as a way to go. This is actually a way that I like looking at the carbon problem. This was popularized by uh, Kumi and Krauss in about 20 years ago. Um, and they know, they can say for every billion tons of carbon we burn, we add about 0.26 parts per million of CO2 to the atmosphere. Um, for every terawatt year, so that's the amount of energy of coal, we add this much parts per million for oil. You can get those numbers. And so, if we chose 450 and we're at 390, we've got about 60 parts per million to go to get to 450, which means we've got about 400 terawatt years of fossil fuel burning left, which is 40 years at 10 terawatts or only 20 years at 20 terawatts. And then once you've done that, you have to stop burning fossil fuels cold turkey. Um, 